Hello everyone, I'm here in studio today with Kai Aderbridge and we are jumping into a topic about vocal registration. Just a little bit about Kai. Um, he is the musical director of Vocal Revolution Men's Chorus, the bass of a quartet called Daily Special. He runs a private vocal studio, Aderbridge Music, doing voice lessons, ensemble coaching, learning tracks and arrangement. And of course, a lover of all things singing. Now that information is current as of March, 2022, but you can check down in the comments if you'd like to know a little bit more about what Kai might be doing as of whenever you're watching this. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I know that uh, it can be a, a confusing one for some people and maybe even a controversial one for some people as uh, we have science and we have sensation and we have where those two things meet and how we can access mm. the concept of register in our voices. So yes. we're going to jump right in. Kai, what are some ways that you like to describe registers? Yeah, that's a great question. And I love what you said about how um, there's a lot of confusion around it. And I think there's confusion because there are just so many different terms that we use to describe registers. Yeah, and, and I'd love to just maybe go through a few of the different terms that singers may have heard and sort of talk about what those terms mean from an anatomical perspective. What terms mean the same thing? What terms are different things? And, and just sort of go through that. Does that work? Absolutely. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, well, I think the most common terms that singers probably have heard are chest voice and head voice to describe sort of what I would consider the two main registers we use in singing. And those terms relate to the perception of those registers, right? So for chest voice, you're going to feel a lot of vibrations in your chest. For head voice, you might feel it more in your head. And while those are perfectly fine terms, there are some other terms that we can use that describe more specifically the anatomical stuff that's happening in these different registers. So take chest voice, right? So in chest voice, the vocal folds are in a thick formation. A big portion of the vocal fold mass is coming together to vibrate. And, um, so sometimes that's just called thick register. That's a, that's a way to describe it, you know, that describes what the vocal folds are doing. It might also be described as mode one, if you want to sort of take any specificity around it out and just sort of say, this is one mode of production for the, for the voice. Uh, sometimes also, you know, full voice is a pretty common one or uh, TA dominant or thyroarytenoid dominant, if you want to get really specific with the anatomy of what is what muscles are most activated during this register, right? So all of those are just options to describe the same fundamentally, you know, similar process of the vocal folds. Uh, then that changes when we get to head voice, where the vocal folds thin out and stretch. And um, so that's sometimes called thin register or mode two or CT dominant, cricothyroid dominant, where there's, um, uh, you know, the cricothyroid muscle is more activated in the process there. And so, um, and falsetto is another one that's, you know, commonly thrown around. That's another just way to describe head voice. Some people will say it's slightly different, but at, at a vocal fold level, it's pretty similar in terms of what it is doing in the, in the, the actual function of the vocal folds. And I think that's a great example of sensation versus if you stuck a camera down there and could see what was right. going on. Some people feel a very specific sensational change uh, between head voice and falsetto. I also love that you, this is always how I talk about vocal folds. And I'm like, we could do right. this, we could do this. And well, hey, they vibrate and they do all these things. So it's yeah, good yeah. to have a little, little tactile uh, representation Definitely. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you haven't, if you haven't seen videos of vocal folds, you know, go, go look them up. It's so fascinating to see what these tiny little things are doing, right? Yeah, they're so yeah. small. They're, they're so, so tiny. Small. Mine are yeah. like the diameter of like a dime. Yeah. Usually probably what, the diameter of a nickel or something. Maybe, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, and I think, like, like what you said about perception, right? It, a lot of times singers will come into a lesson and they will already have a sense of, this is my head voice or this is my whatever and this is my this and these feel different and even if they don't have terms to describe it they can get a sense of this part of my voice feels really different than this part of my voice and why is that right and so then we can dive into what is actually happening and what what makes those different and also just saying it's fine for them to be different right i think that's common a common thing is why does my voice suddenly go away when i get high and it's like no right. it's just why is this one easier thing. for me why does this one feel yeah. more natural for me well you speak in that part of your voice, it's probably a little stronger than the other part of your oh, voice if yeah, you haven't yeah. been working on it. Exactly, yeah. 
And so we'll, we'll work to sort of balance those registers and find more flexibility at the laryngeal level to switch back and forth and, and sort of just explore all the different sounds that you want to make. I love that. While we're talking about different sounds, right, there are other registers too. I don't want to just say there's just head and chest. You know, there's vocal fry, there's whistle tone, um, and um, those are just less less common, commonly used in, in most singing. So, Right. I hear uh, vocal fry like sometimes in, uh, a bass singer in country music. Like, oh, sure. Uh, uh, ring of fire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or used as an onset like, hey, 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 you know, that's sometimes a thing that happens in pop music. Yeah. Right. This is as the the... The specificity of pitch is a little harder to define during a vocal vocal sure. fry. When you go to vocal fry, your vocal folds are like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's not a really, cl it's hard to, yeah, there is maybe some sense of pitch, but it's a totally different process of the vocal folds where yeah, chest that's the That's the technical motion that goes with vocal fry. Yeah. I so, often say yeah. when I'm having singers do a vocal fry um, as like a relaxation method, it's kind of totally. like a yeah. massage for your vocal folds. We'll just get them to relax and just kind of yeah, pop around like a little bit. Popping around. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And whistle yeah. register, you'll hear like Mariah Carey, like that, <laughs> that right. stuff up there, right? I can't do that one, but. Uh, you don't have to. <laughs> Some people, yeah, yeah, a lot of people just <laughs> can't do that. Whatever works That's fine, you. you know? Okay, so classically, I would be grouped into the umbrella of probably mezzo-soprano. So that means when I end up singing with choruses or choirs, I would often be sorted into something like first alto, maybe second soprano. In barbershop, I sing baritone, which kind of lives in that first alto range most of the time. Um, and so I've accepted my role kind of crossing over between head voice and chest voice. That's really important to to the technique of things that I do. But what about people who sing mostly soprano or mostly tenor or mostly bass, um, how aware do they need to be of other ranges? I will offer you a loaded question. Can't they just hang out in that range where they are most natural and most comfortable and not worry about the other registers? Yeah, I mean, they could, but I think it is helpful for every singer to explore all the possibilities of their voice, right? And I think it's a helpful, it's helpful to, dis to distinguish between what is a performance sound and what is a rehearsal sound, right? So basses, when singing in their head voice, particularly when they're just sort of learning about the head voice for the first time, maybe, it's not going to be a particularly, you know, beautiful sound or, or necessarily something that they, that they would want to do on stage. But it's still so useful for the vocal mechanism to experience this different mode of vibration. Yeah, and, and it can help to it can help to improve pitch control and it can expand the artistic palette with all the different textures that you can make. And I also think it's just kind of a healthy thing for the voice to do, uh, especially when it's supervised by a voice teacher, you know, to, to get your voice doing all these different things. That's a sign of vocal freedom, right? It can be an indication that you've let go of any tensions that are getting in the way or, or hold, holding in the, any of these muscles around the voice, when these are all relaxed and released, then your voice will be able to make all these different sounds with ease. And that's an indication that you're doing some really healthy vocalizing and some good, good vocal work. So I think it's really important and helpful no matter what singer, what kind of singer you are, what, what, what range you typically sing in to explore all that your voice has to offer. Cause you know, why not? That's great. I love, metaphor in in the work that we do kind of alongside with with the science and I hear you talking about colors like like painting a picture you have a different mm. palette you have access to when you're talking about just using one part of your voice I'm imagining like a bodybuilder who decides they're only going to do like upper body oh my gosh yeah <laughs> can you imagine his little That's like great. and then beefy up I have the top. best arms but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my arms are amazing yeah. don't look at my legs there. Don't look at that. Can we talk a little bit about how we might treat these issues differently depending on what kind of music we're singing? I definitely believe that good singing is good singing. Healthy singing is healthy singing across genres. But obviously we're going to experience differences if we're singing rock versus opera or classical choral music versus barbershop or if we're a Broadway soloist. So what are your thoughts generally on that? Yeah, I think this is another source of confusion with registers is because different voice teachers um, who who stay to one style will have different sort of aesthetic goals when it comes to registers. For classical singers, the goal might be more to have a unified voice all the way through the range with no noticeable break, no noticeable passaggio, just 
seemingly one register for their entire range. Even though those anatomical changes may be happening and probably are happening, the sensation for the audience and even possibly for the singer may be that there's just one register, one voice all the way through. Whereas in popular music, you know, commercial music nowadays, if you listen to any, any you know, recent song, you'll hear some really extreme examples of registers, you know, belting for, you know, ex an extreme version of chest voice or even some breathy head voice, you know, and alternating between these, even in the same song or in the same line, intentional breaks or voice cracks and all right, these Right, like things. sometimes they'll put that yodely yeah. thing in, right? Totally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's just used artistically to get the expression that they want, right? And that can be done healthily. You know, there's nothing unhealthy about isolating registers or, or switching between registers quickly, but those artistic choices just wouldn't wouldn't um, be as accepted in the classical genre, right? So it's all good. It's all just used for expression. And then, you know, even with the chorus, the choruses to an extent, there's different different ideas about how how to find a unified chorus sound. Some choruses maybe are looking for all of their singers to have that sort of connected voice all the way through, where some choruses might say, no, in this spot we want this section to, you know, really belt this or this section to be really light and breathy. And they maybe will use these register extremes for artistic purposes. And yeah, all of it's good if it's done, if it's done in a, a healthy, easy way that isn't, you know, causing vocal damage. And, um, right, yeah. right. Just to extend that a little bit. Yeah. When we sing a very high note, okay, bam, it pops in a head voice. We sing a very low note, bam, it's in chest voice. Yeah. Talk about the idea of having some options in the middle. What can totally. we do? What can we do in the middle to like, what are our choices? Can we sing chest voice high? Can we sing head voice low? Totally. Yeah. So in the work of isolating registers, what that often often entails is bringing head voice kind of as low as it can go and exploring a really low head voice place, which may not, particularly at the start, may not sound particularly powerful or, or um, you know, useful for performance, but it's useful for the voice. Um, or then also extending chest voice higher and getting comfortable with that. And then, so that means there's a huge range or, or you know, a, a, an area in the middle where you can do either and you get to sort of pick and, and choose which sound you want. And singers can also, to an extent, experience sort of gradients in the middle. Even if the, the vibratory pattern is this is is not actually something in between, it is one of the two, the sensation for the singer and the sound that is coming out may be a lighter chest voice or a or a a fuller fuller head voice, right? Some people will call this a mix, you know, a, a chest mix or a head mix or a just a mixed voice. They'll just describe it as that, where it's something that feels or sounds like it's in the middle and at that point, you know, it's, it does it matter that much, you know, what's actually happening, you know, Perfect. it just matters that the singer is experiencing and creating the sound that they want to create to have the emotional impact that they want to have. So um, I think the work of registers is, is about finding that, finding options, finding all of the options in the middle and all of the extremes so that you can just do whatever you want to do and make the sounds that you want to make. Maybe let's talk through some seven different ways to explore these registers. Oh, uh, maybe some yeah. vocal exercises we could do. Yeah, so something we didn't talk about before when we were talking about um, how to isolate registers is the idea of how different vowels can sometimes elicit different register responses. So closed vowels like ooh and e can tend to um, help, help find head voice and more open vowels like ah uh, can find chest voice. So if we're gonna isolate head voice, this should be a very light exercise, and we're just going to do the words U, 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 U. It's very light, very, it could be even a little breathy. And so this may be very light, it may be, may be tricky as we get lower, but we're just going to keep, stay in that head voice as we get lower, even if it, the, the sound gets, you know, gets out of what we might consider a performance sound. So. keep going down if you can but um, yeah so we're just like bringing the head voice kind of down as far as it'll go right there right? absolutely yeah yeah 
and that will feel very pre potentially pretty unusual for you right because we would pretty rarely choose to sing in head voice down that low but it really isolates that voice and gets you familiar with it in a great way yeah so then on the flip side if we want to isolate chest uh, i'll use yeah 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 so i'll often have singers say like yeah 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 i get it yeah 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 and just speak it because that will create that that chest voice quality and then just singing it yeah 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 um or we can go let's go here so if you want to do it on the higher octave that's fine yeah 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 and you can just keep that register and bring that up as high as it can comfortably go right and likely you'll experience a little bit of overlap or maybe a lot of overlap in terms of where those registers can exist and then the, what after we've isolated registers what i'll do is we'll we'll do a little alternating between them so we're gonna go ah for the chest voice ah for the chest voice up to ooh for the head voice ah ooh. Uh, so we want the bottom one to be pretty loud and full and the top one to be a little uh, lighter or you know more head voice here we go yeah and you can do that higher lower you know you can do it alternating on the same pitch or bigger intervals or any of that just to sort of get the voice very you know quickly going chest voice, head voice, chest voice, head voice. And that quick shifting of the voice is just a great way to sort of encourage vocal freedom and get the voice doing some stuff that it doesn't usually do. So those, those are some, some of my exercises. Yeah, right I love it. I love the idea of just kind of experimentation, figure totally. out what my voice wants to do where and what, what I can allow it to do where, should yeah. I choose to use those different registers on different right. pitches. I love that so much. Options, the more options we have, the better being connected with sensation, love that so much. There is a lot of conversation to be had around mix, does mixed voice exist? Right. So maybe we'll just put a little teaser at like future, future conversations to be had ah. um, and sensation versus science. Um, and I know that that's gonna maybe leave some people with more questions than answers, but I'm going to put out there that that's okay because having those questions and exploring how things feel, I think are a huge part of our vocal journeys. Yeah, let's just add one tangent, sort of one little sort of side comment, just in case there are um, some people out there who are confused. Some people will experience or talk about or use the word register to describe things that aren't happening from a laryngeal standpoint. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll use it to describe differences in how the voice moves through pitch naturally and how the harmonics play into the the the, the the, the resonation of the voice. And, and there's so much interesting stuff within that that would take way too long to talk about now. If you're interested, I would recommend um, Ken Bozeman's work. He has done some really awesome stuff talking about um, what are called acoustic registers, right? So they're, they're connected and oftentimes um, similar, can, can be similar in their presentation as laryngeal registers. But today, I think we're just talking about laryngeal registers. What are the vocal folds doing as we traverse our range? Right. Where anatomical, or where uh, acoustic registers are more about, are, are more of a thing that are used in, in maybe um, like classical singing, particularly for high sopranos. Um, you know, you may notice if you, get, if you get really high, suddenly the vowel definition goes away and there's only certain vowels that you can create. And so uh, there's a, a spot, a specific spot where that happens. And that, you know, in some sense could be called a different register. But right. there's nothing, nothing different happening here, right? That's great. So, and there's a whole yeah. conversation about that, about formants and ha how totally. harmonic series work. I'll go ahead and link Bozeman's book uh, down in the about. Awesome. That, um, the book that is, is very, very small, right? It's, it's yeah. a really oh. narrow book. And it takes forever to get through because it is so dense and so yeah. scientific. Uh, but some really wonderful work. Yeah, uh, if, 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 science, if science is not your jam, I maybe wouldn't recommend it. But if you're really curious to know you know, um, why does my voice suddenly s sound so different around these notes, you know? Why can why does this vowel sound like this here and this vowel sounds like this here? You know, Absolutely. it's definitely a great, great book to read. Fantastic, thanks for bringing that up. Totally. I wanna to thank you so much for joining me today. Um, again, everybody, if you wanna know more about Kai, check down in the about below and we will see you next time. Thanks, Kathleen. And of course, Celeste the cat has come to say hi. She's very interested in vocal registers, so. 
Meow. Meow. Uh, there's a head voice. No. <laughs> Im imitate a cat and you'll find some head voice. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Imitate a cat, you'll find your head voice. Meow. <laughs> That's the title, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Are you okay to eat?